the research worker you see here is just about ready to chuck it all and go fishing. For the past four months, he has worked on a detailed research project and has just met with failure in his verification of results. What is wrong? He's a qualified man, provided with the very finest working tools in laboratory equipment. He knows where the trouble lies because in his own words, it happens every day. His most important laboratory tools, the animals he employs in research, are unreliable. I suppose the first thing to answer is to throw back a question, who or what is an animal? When we think about lab animals, we're really thinking about a specific subset of the very contradictory relationships we have with all kinds of other animals. Lab animals are very specific in the sense that we expect them to kind of stand in for us. Standing in as models for our physical illnesses or mental illnesses and their animalness gets subordinated to that particular role. But they are also animals. They are rats or mice or chimpanzees or dogs or whatever, with all the species specificities that that entails. There was a very interesting study some years ago now by a sociologist of science, Michael Lynch, who was interviewing people who were doing neurophysiological experiments, maybe using rats. And he noted a, an important distinction, which is between the naturalistic animal and the analytic animal. So when these scientists would talk about that was good data, what they meant was they got a good slide taken from the animal's brain after its death, um, meaning, well, we've got a good slide here. We can actually see the nerve cells or whatever. Not that it was a well-behaved animal or whatever that might mean in its life. And in order to become a lab animal, it's got to make that transition from being a natural animal to being an analytic animal to becoming data to becoming a tool of the trade. And a great deal of scientific practice over the last century or so has been about making animals into data. Most people who are working with lab animals do actually recognise that they are animals, that they can bite and they need feeding and they, you know, they need various things. But in terms of the overall practices of science, it is still animals that are bred in order to become part of the apparatuses of science. science side of anthropology so I did a lot of anatomy and, uh, and also I was trying to get a biology minor I think for a while so I took a lot of genetics and chemistry and biology classes and I don't know at some point I, mean, I needed to work and uh, I had worked in some restaurants and then I guess the, you know I just knew more and more professors and I there was a job at in my medical training, like everyone else, I read the medical literature and we came to understand or think that we understood that using various animals to address human diseases was essential that there was no other way to do it. 
and I became interested in studying coronary artery disease. And as I finished my postgraduate cardiology training in Boston, I arranged to continue in the research vein on uh, the basis of a five-year grant that I received from the American Heart Association. Well, for a number of years, did research using non-human animals in ways that were harmful to them. I had been trained in the kind of classic uh, Western medicine thinking that this was an appropriate way to resolve biological questions. And I was a principal investigator involving a number of projects. During that time, I started questioning what I was doing and whether it was not so much scientifically appropriate, but whether it was ethically appropriate. And I questioned my colleagues in the field and was surprised at the extreme defensiveness. I found that some of the animal technicians were asking me to become a bit more involved in, in some of the work, for example, like picking up the dogs and taking them from the pens to the technicians who would then be force feeding these animals with capsules which they would force down their throats. So it got too difficult for me and, and I decided to leave and it was very difficult to leave. Um, I mean in one sense there was a, a great relief that I no longer had to go back to that place um, but at the same time I felt um, guilty about leaving those animals behind. Um, but I left, you know, determined that I would actually make sure that I did reveal what was going on to them. In 19th century physiology, people would use whatever species came to hand, and that might mean dogs, which perhaps were garnered from the street. It might mean grabbing frogs out of the local pond or whatever. And a great deal of physiology was done on a variety of different species. But over time, that narrowed down. And again, you know, these are the animals, of course, which are supposed to stand for a generalization across all species, all vertebrates or all mammals. But in fact, historically, the diversity of species using, used in animal labs declined considerably. Uh, so that was the first stage. You're standardized in the sense of you're limiting the number of species. And then what you're getting is standardized laboratory animals uh, as bred for particular kinds of traits over the next century. But it's not just a selection for behavioural and physiological traits. It also goes hand in hand with standardisation of laboratory practices. To take one example, in order to do interventions in the brain of a living animal, they require that the head will have to be trapped in, into a special apparatus, a stereotaxic um, apparatus. And there was a period in the history of, of, of 
the mid 20th century neurophysiology where they they were trying to get uh, animals rats and mice particularly that, that fit the apparatus they you know particularly large ones wouldn't fit the apparatus so there's a standardization of of equipment going on at the same time as there's a standardization of animals there's also a standardization of spaces in that I suppose at the end of the 19th century it was probably relatively commonplace to have animals perhaps in the next room or in the same room or whatever or you'd go and get it from outside. Increasingly over the 20th century and particularly since the Second World War, the separation of animal laboratory and animal house became more apparent and perhaps that was at its most extreme with one of the labs that we were visiting in in the course of our research study in the UK because the scientists were telling us that the animal house was some miles away and the scientists only dealt with tissues so what they did was to telephone or fax the um, technicians who were working in the animal house and saying we want such and such tissues today and technicians would deal with the animal they'd kill it and, and dissect it and remove the tissues and then send the tissues by courier to the scientists and they, the technicians would tell us well we do try and encourage the scientists to come down and see the real animals sometimes but of course there is a massive separation here it's even a geographical one between where the animals are actually living and the practices of the laboratory. So there's been a standardisation in that sense of both animals and people and spaces over a hundred or so years. In the heart of Cambridgeshire, surrounded by miles of beautiful, low-lying countryside, lies a small village called Woolley. Driving from Woolley towards the A1, one cannot fail to notice what appears to be a large industrial complex snugly situated in the valley. At a distance, it resembles a large factory with its chimneys and assortment of buildings. A fairly innocuous looking place, set back off the A1, surrounded by open fields. On approaching the site, you can see that it is totally surrounded by high wire fencing. There are also video cameras set back within the grounds. Those buildings that do have a windows are often blanked out completely. As you drive nearer to the main gates of the site, you can see security guards. If you slow down in your car, do not be surprised when they step out of their office to watch you. You may even see them writing something down and talking into hand radios. Surely they are not taking down your car number. Again, you wonder what sort of establishment this could possibly be. Could it be something to do with the armed forces? There is nothing to suggest what might be taking place here behind all this security. The centre is well known in the area. Indeed, many locals have worked there or have family or friends employed at the complex. Those that haven't are well informed nevertheless. The centre's work has been the subject of heated local debate for years. Behind those brick walls and blanked out windows are thousands upon thousands of animals being forced to take part in toxicological research something you could not possibly have known from simply driving past. But then you weren't supposed to. le matin puis on se change pour pas contaminer dans les pièces euh, les comme nos vêtements d'extérieur puis toutes ces choses là on va rentrer le matin on va faire qu'est-ce qu'on appelle des signes cliniques so on va évaluer le euh, health status de l'animal make sure that euh, le thé qu'on donne s'il y a pas des effets secondaires comme on va évaluer euh, feces euh, scabs stuff like that oui on écrit tout there's different studies that are, there's different types of studies. You have IV studies, you have intramuscular studies, you have inhalation studies, you have, uh, you know, the, ça dépend de la voie d'administration que le médicament va être donné. So you have, obviously, the inhalation studies for the monkeys are very hard because monkeys, when they're stressed, they tend to stop breathing. And having a mask in your face, being sitting in a chair, don't know what's going on, getting stuff blown in your face. So souvent, on avait des, des singes qui faisaient des arrêts respiratoires. Puis là, c'est emergency, il faut revivre les animaux, tout ça. Fait que c'est beaucoup stressant pour nous, puis pour les singes aussi. 
Ça, c'est régulier. C'est à toutes les fois qu'on a une étude d'inhalation de singes, on assigne, dépendant de combien de singes qui sont dosés en même temps, c'est un technicien pour deux animaux. Versus les chiens, où ça va être un pour quatre animaux. Juste parce qu'il faut être constant monitoring of the animal, parce que ça arrête comme ça. C'est une seconde, il respire, l'autre seconde, c'est that's it. C'est plus, je dirais, les, les études anti-cancer sont les plus dures sur les animaux. Because uh, you know what an anti-cancer is doing. It's like mm -hmm. chemo on a person is hard. Fait que sur toutes les tests, euh, souvent c'est les animaux ont plus de, de side effects pour tout ça. Il y a aussi les, um, les études qui appellent ça maximum tolerated dose. Ça c'est des études où ils savent que le produit fonctionne, but they're not sure how high the concentration can be for it still to be safe. So they test until usually a fatality or a near fatality. They will start, like let's say, on week one, they'll start uh, just with the vehicle. And then on week two, they're going to give empty dose. On week three, they're going to, until they see what they want to see. It's hard to be in my position and say that it's all wrong or say that it's right. And because I see the repercussions that all of that has on the chimpanzees. And it's sad to say I'm only 23 and animal death doesn't do anything for me like I can. C'est comme quand Tom est décédé, c'est la première fois vraiment que j'ai pleuré parce qu'un animal est décédé parce que j'ai pas pu rien faire pour l'aider. Tandis qu'en laboratoire, quand il y a des situations comme ça, il y a tout le temps un vétérinaire qui va venir puis ils vont tout le temps ramener l'animal. C'est quand tu dis que t'es six mois tous les jours avec les mêmes animaux toute la journée, puis ok, c'est la journée nécropsie, mais ok, c'est correct. Puis je trouvais que c'était mieux que les animaux meurent qui restent là parce que je me dis dans le fond c'est comme la liberté pour eux. I mean mostly my my experience has been that people have never thought about it at all. You know, they, they don't have any preconceived notion because it's just never crossed their mind to think about. One thing that always I, I find very discouraging, um, you know, and I if there's an article on lab animals or especially primates in labs and you know I I tend to read people's comments that they write in to those kind of articles and and or, or even comments that researchers make in those type of articles when they you know talk about you know we have the animal welfare act we do this research humanely and you know we take really good care of our animals and we give them enrichment and the animal welfare act protects them and ensures that we do humane work and humane care i think that's That's a huge misconception, I think. The Animal Welfare Act provides really minimal standards and requirements for enrichment in particular. And, you know, to me, when you're looking at a monkey who may have been wild caught and is now living in a, you know, two foot by two foot by, you know, two foot stainless steel box in a cinder block room you know, slapping a little forage board in front of them and giving them some sunflower seeds to pick at. I mean, that's all the law requires. And I mean, I, I don't see what's enriching about that. And I don't, I don't see anything humane about that. And I, I you know, it, it's still, I think it's a huge misconception to think that well, we have laws in place. Well, we're, you know, we always treat them humanely because the law protects them. I think that's a huge fallacy. I thought the building was really beautiful, the Med Sciences building in particular. It just, it was this, you know, really old stone building and it just, it was just kind of beautiful, haunting sort of place, it, you know. I was often completely alone there with all the animals and so that's me in the lab 20 years ago plus. Um, I'm in one of the bird rooms. I can't tell what kind of birds are in those cages, but uh, there's birds all around me. It's me and my scrubs. This seems to be a photo of the cat bird room. Uh, this would have been one of the cat birds I worked with. Cat birds are not very personable, so I had no relationships with any of them. At Yerkes, well, for one, I think the stakes were higher at Yerkes. You know, I think I had some sense that taking photos will get me fired, you know, so there was that, because it was before we had little tiny cameras that fit in your pocket. So, you know, I think part of it was 
was that. But I think a lot more of it at Yerkes was I just, I didn't want to document it. I, I, in some ways it's like I was there yesterday, the amount of detail I recall and the, you know, the faces I can still picture, but I just, you know, and especially I thought about taking photos of Jerome and I just, I just couldn't do it. I just, I didn't want to capture him. I didn't want to remember. I didn't want to, you know, someday flip back through my old pictures of all those good times, you know, the good times I never had in the lab and the good times they never ever had their whole lives in the lab. Rodents are the animal of choice for a great many experiments. Um, they're purpose bred to become a huge variety of animal models for human illnesses. Uh, but part of the reason that they become acceptable is because in the rest of the, our culture they are seen as vermin. And we have a long history of very close association. They're the, one of the most commensal species with us. They live very closely to us. It's been said that you're never more than five meters away from a rat, um, which is a, sometimes a scary thought when you think about them in, living in the sewers and so on. And uh, it's partly because of that that, for example, the British Home Office, who oversee all experimentation in the UK, they produce an annual report which tells, says about what experiments have been done and in, you know, in broad brush terms. But one of the lines in this is always 85 or so percent of experiments in the last year were done on rats and mice. Because that's what, where public opinion is much more likely to be swayed. And if you do, there have been a number of surveys of public opinion and most people will say that they'll accept various procedures in scientific experiments to be done on rodents, which they would not accept on dogs or primates. Uh, people draw the line differently. It's much more acceptable. Unfortunately, if you don't take your rat, um, they euthanize them. So uh, her being very allergic um, and also not wanting a pet rat, uh, I ended up taking her and snuck her into my residence and she lived the rest of uh, the year there with me, sort of illegally. appointed to the campus-wide animal use committee and what we did was look at every protocol that used non-human animals and make a determination whether the protocol could be improved with respect to welfare issues and whether the protocol should be allowed. 
I viewed my position on the committee as being an advocate for the animals. I don't believe that there was another person on the committee who had the views that I had, and this was demonstrated by how they voted. But I also recognized that I couldn't simply blanket vote no, because if I did that, then nobody would listen to me. They would just say, well, Ned always votes no, so what, what's the point? You know, he doesn't make anything different based on the quality or, or aspects of the research project or teaching. So I was very careful about when I voted no. I tried to reserve my no vote for those situations which I thought were particularly egregious. Uh, to give you an example, there was an experiment where mosquitoes were being studied, but a mammal was being used, a mouse, to feed these mosquitoes every day. And this mouse, or a mouse I should say, because I imagine it was different mice at different times, would be put into a small tube with lots of holes in the tube. He or she would be suspended by a string above the mosquitoes, within the mosquito cage. The mouse could not turn around, could not scratch, could not in any way defend herself or himself, and was allowed, was going to be allowed to feed the mosquitoes all night long. I objected strenuously to this. I thought this was one of the most inhumane things that they were trying to do on the campus. And I pleaded with my fellow committee members to not allow this at all because there were alternatives. In fact, at our sister or sibling institution at Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley, a researcher was doing similar studies with mosquitoes but was feeding them blood from student volunteers and paid the students to, to do this. Quite acceptable from a scientific and uh, ethical perspective. I think I got a few, a few of my committee members to vote no, but ultimately um, the majority voted yes, but with a reduced exposure time down to two hours, which to me made no sense. I mean, two hours to the mouse was a lifetime. She was just 14 weeks old, and she was just so cute, and she was so scared. And it, what a difference from, I mean, these clips where she's confident and running around and doing her stuff. She was very, very scared. Uh, she didn't want to be handled. Uh, she was sort of afraid of people. And, um, and again, within, within a week, this, like, little personality came out. <laughs> She actually, she would hang out on my shoulder. She crawled in my sleeve. She used to sleep in my sleeve while I was studying. She'd crawl up my arm and just hang out in between the space between my elbow and my, and my long sleeve shirt. Um, I remember sometimes my arm would get tired and I would want to have to put it down, but I didn't want to disturb her. Um, she, her thing was, she would bring one blanket into her igloo. I used to put the igloo on top. And <laughs> She would pull the blanket in and then stuff it so that Gabby couldn't get in. <laughs> and then she would just sleep in there. She loved it. But if he tried to come in, there would be like a screaming, a screaming war. They shriek. She, she was a drama queen. They have this course and these labs every semester, every year. So really it's nothing that a student can read in a book and say, yes, if you feed them this, this, this. It enhances exercise or performance by this, this, this. It's not like we're talking about groundbreaking, life-saving research here. This is a third-year university course with a basic nutrition premise. And again, they use a chicken in the next semester as well. And that poor chicken, luckily Jessica also found a home for her chicken, but most people weren't able to take them or weren't able to find them a home. And most people wouldn't necessarily care because when you sign up for the course you know you're just trying to learn your basic nutrition principles and you don't think you're going to have to be finding a home for an animal um, it's sort of if you want the animal you can take it if not it's going to be euthanized I graduated in 2002 and I went into the 
research industry and it was really interesting. It was pretty much the foundation of all my research stemmed there. I learned a lot of um, basic research techniques used in the laboratory and towards the second year I was in the field we entered more into animal testing. Um, in particular we were using mice and you know in order to work with mice in general uh, we had to go through a lot of training. I, I remember you know, we learned handling techniques, ways to collect blood like retroorbital bleeds, um, terminal cardiac puncture, how to identify mice. So we used, worked on uh, tagging mice, tagging their ears, and how to kill mice using uh, CO2. Yeah, I, I, I didn't like any of it, but I just accepted it at the time as something that had to be done. You know, I remember just putting lots of mice in the CO2 chamber and just turning the CO2 up and um, watching them as asphyxiate. And I mean, it's a tough, it's a tough thing to see. Um, you know, you're destroying a life. Um, and it was just, it was horrible. It really was horrible. Um, and that's when I, you know, that's the first time I, I asked one of the lead researchers who I was helping out at the time, I asked him, you know, how do you deal with this? You know, this is a horrible thing to see and do. How do you, how do you actually, how do you deal with this? And I remember he said, you know, you have to see that you're doing something good, that you're doing this for the greater good of science and advancement and research. And, you know, I, it's, it's, it, it was tough for me to buy into, but, you know, I, I tried to convince myself that that was the case, that this was all necessary. You know, it weighs heavy on me, and I, I just, you know, didn't, I, I didn't know what it was for. I, I just didn't see the meaning of having to do this to, to an animal. Some people would argue, oh, 12 weeks in the lab, that's not that bad. Um, well, A, there's no one saying that the student's going to be able to adopt it or take it. And B, um, that is actually a significant portion of that animal's life, where it isn't in contact with other rats. They weren't allowed to be housed together. Each one was in its separate cage with a different food, with a different wheel, with a different terms for that experiment. The only human contact they were allowed was for recording the measurements. Uh, there was no social time, no play time. There was no external sort of stimuli. And these animals um, basically were just mere subjects of reading a number off a wheel, information that we've already produced and isn't going to further us anymore, especially not in terms of nutrition. I think I was surprised myself that, you know, the first day I was taking this rat going, what am I doing taking a rat? Um, I was so touched by how much these little critters actually worked their way into my heart. I mean, they're so affectionate, they're so, they're so social. If you've, if you've had a pet growing up, you know they, just like individuals, they have certain um, tendencies or little characteristics or traits or things that they like to do. And you really learn that these are actual lives. They feel pain, you know, they they have personalities, they there's fa they have favorite foods. There was even certain music that they responded to when I would play in my room more than others. Um, and I think me just learning this unintentionally, yeah, I wasn't planning on I guess having this sort of experience it made me sort of a rat advocate. <laughs> I yeah, I perpetually then would go to school and get so frustrated that Every day there's thousands of them who didn't have a home, didn't have contact uh, from either a human or any other animal, didn't get to see sunlight, didn't get to experience sleeping in a hammock or a bed, uh, didn't get fresh foods, didn't get fresh fruits and vegetables and, and get to experience like all the things that we enjoy.
every one of our facilities is regularly inspected for regulatory compliance and each of them has accreditation for animal welfare standards from the American Association for the Advancement of Laboratory Animal Care. We take the care of our animals very seriously and our high ethical standards are core to our corporate philosophy. Producers of particular strains of lab animals have to try to sell them. That's what their job is, isn't it? They sell the, sell the product, and it's called a product. So they are in the business of trying to breed animals for particular traits. And so then they say that, you know, these are well-produced animals, it's a good product, uh, there's not much variability, um, you can rely on us. Uh, but these are, in a certain way, those are the kind of tropes of advertising generally, aren't they? That, you know, we produce a good product. Um, so the other side of advertising is to say that this will help research, these animals will help research. And there's a difference here. This is where we're talking about something different from other products, where this will help your research, which could mean a bit of apparatus for number crunching. These animals will help your research. And what's interesting here is that sometimes you, you will get a depiction of the animal that makes it much more of a naturalistic animal again. This might be done by a cartoon pose so that it's wearing human clothes. So it's kind of quasi-animal, quasi-person, but it's certainly represented as though it's some sort of living, sentient creature. It's not just a thing at this point. You're not going to see so much of the numbers. You actually might see a representation of the animal as a photograph, or you might see a line drawing of an animal, but it is very clearly an animal at this point. And it's being made back into a naturalistic animal in order to, to sell its particular characteristics. I remained in rodent toxicology until July. At my request, I had asked for a transfer to the dog toxicology unit to embark on the next stage in the investigation. Despite being pleased that I had been granted the transfer, I knew that after having already spent five months at HRC, I now had to find new reserves of emotional and physical energy to get me through the next few months. Once again, I found myself peering into rooms full of beagles. The last time I had done so was during my interview in January. Now, almost six months later, I was ready to record and photograph day-to-day -day life within the dog toxicology unit. There were three dog units altogether with the capacity to house up to 1,500 beagles at any one time. HRC proudly claimed that this is the largest dog laboratory facility in Europe. Units J06 and D12 were the two experimental buildings containing 20 and 10 rooms respectively. I was told by another member of staff that the beagles were bred locally in Huntingdon at an establishment called Interfauna. Interfauna was founded by two ex-HRC employees and breeds a variety of animal species for research. studying the usefulness of radio-labeled imaging agents to study the coronary artery disease and hopefully to uh, detect blockages in the coronary arteries using radioactive tracers and special cameras. 
the animals that I used were dogs. I did not have in my mind at the time where those dogs were obtained. I assumed they were purchased from dealers, but they could have been pound seizure animals for all I knew at the time. The dogs were anesthetized and the tracers were injected intravenously and we did imaging to detect where the radio tracers were going in the heart. Then, in order to understand the distribution of the radio tracer into the coronary arteries and into the heart muscle, uh, we took the dogs off the gantries, we took them in the uh, operating suite, and we opened their chests, removed their hearts, and then slice the heart into sections so that we could study them grossly and under the microscope. The life of a beagle at HRC comprised being shut in a barren, unfriendly cell with no bedding or play objects. They were allowed just half a spadeful of sawdust to aid the cleaning out process and a food and water bowl. It was a terrible way for a highly sociable pack animal to have to spend his or her life. On top of these conditions, the beagles then had to endure the pain and suffering associated with the daily toxicity tests. I watched as these tiny bundles of pent-up energy threw themselves around their small, bare cells, bored and frustrated. On opening the cage door, they would tumble out and hurl themselves up and down the room. As one beagle was released, others would catch sight of him or her darting around and start barking excitedly, waiting for their turn. After just a couple of minutes of frantic activity, they would struggle in my arms as I picked them up to return them to their cages. Once back in, they would throw themselves at the cage door as I closed it behind them. After having worked in the unit for just a short while, I soon discovered that this excitable behaviour shown by the puppies the darting around and refusing to return to their cages does not last long in most of the dogs. In just a few weeks, those who still ventured out of their cages, and many would not, would meekly return, offering no resistance, their spirit broken. If you subscribe to the notion that that kind of research is essential to advance human medicine, and your career and your life revolve around advancing human medicine, then you come to see it as a necessary evil. It wasn't until I was doing it that I realized that wasn't true, but that's how you view it. Um, I had dogs who lived with me at the time. I love dogs. The way I always put it was, if anyone tried to harm my dogs, I'm afraid I might kill them. It sounds extreme, but that's how your mind works when your dogs are your children. And yet here I was, uh, getting in my car every day, going to um, the cardiology department, to my lab, and killing dogs. When you compartmentalize it, you can keep cognitive dissonance at arm's length. You can defend your psyche by understanding that your dogs are your family and this is your work and your work is focused on saving lives. There came a time when I started to realize that what I was doing with dogs in the laboratory wasn't quite what I thought it was in terms of contributing to human health and that began to dovetail with the dissonance aspect of it. I was losing the battle with cognitive dissonance. And I finally had to realize that the only difference between my dogs and these dogs was that my dogs got lucky. That's not a basis for using an animal for experiments and killing the animals. One got lucky, one didn't.
cuando la cogimos eh, era una perra muy miedosa, tenía muchas fobias, o sea, simplemente el hecho de, de bajar unas escaleras no, no, lo entre, no lo entendía y de hecho pues hasta tuvimos que estar ahí bajando escaleras para que ella pudiera, pudiera asimilar que no pasaba nada, que no era nada agresivo para ella. Eh, simplemente el hecho de bajar a la calle era, para ella era algo aterrador, pero a la vez que aterrador también tenía mucha, muchas ganas de, de probar cosas nuevas, de, de curiosear, ¿no? Entonces, eh, los olores, la vista, ¿no? Todo, todas las cosas, ya era como descubrirlo todo por primera vez, o sea, como una segunda vida. Si lo explicas, claro, desde una perspectiva de un perro, yo creo que, que ya describiría su anterior vida como, una, como algo de privación, ¿no? De, de privación de libertad, de, de privación de emociones, también de, incluso de sentidos, ¿no? Porque, pues eso, de, no sé, de ya como que tenía miedo, pues, a cualquier sonidos extraños, pues, eh, pues eso, serían todos siempre sonidos muy, muy tenues, sería todo muy gris, ¿no? eh, la oscuridad, el miedo a, las, a saber qué no, es lo que te va a ocurrir, viendo que tus compañeros están también en las jaulas, eh, entonces sería una vida como, como de secuestrado, ¿no? una, como si te hubieras secuestrado desde tu nacimiento y no, no hubieses conocido otra cosa que una cárcel. Entonces yo creo que es algo muy duro eh, y supongo que ya lo describiría así, ¿no? como una vida llena de privaciones, una vida pues, de esclavo, ¿no? de, de recluso, de un perro que ha estado encarcelado. So I made the very difficult determination to uh, stop doing uh, experiments on dogs or any other animals and uh, took that decision to my uh, supervisor and that conversation was not pleasant and resulted in me leaving that program Uh, fortunately, I was able to take my grant with me by rewriting a new grant uh, based on uh, imaging studies in patients, human patients. So I was able to continue my career, but that my academic career as a research cardiologist was up in smoke. And interestingly, that as I left his office uh, with that knowledge, it was okay with me because it had just fallen off my shoulders. I didn't have to fight that battle anymore, trying to justify what I was doing and the basis of what my beliefs were regarding animals. Ella, en todo este año, lo que realmente ha cambiado, que ha sido mucho, ha sido a superar todos sus miedos. Ha sido a ver que la vida es, es completamente distinta a lo que le ofrecían al principio y que la va a poder disfrutar que va a poder oler las cosas, que va a poder relacionarse con otros perros, con otros humanos, con otros animales. Ella ahora pues es, es completamente, o sea, yo la veo pues feliz eh, cuando, cuando recibe una visita, eh, se pone feliz. Es una perra que, que vamos, que tiene muy, muy poquitos miedos, que, que enseguida pues eh, le gusta inspeccionar las cosas, busca tu cariño, ha cambiado mucho. Para mí es ponerle a a esos seres que pues en vídeos o ves en fotos o ves cuando lees cosas ponerle una cara, ¿no? un nombre, una, una persona que hay detrás que sufre ¿no? viendo que es un ser que quiere, que quiere tener libertad, que quiere vivir plenamente y claro, lógicamente para mí refuerza aún más si cabe eh, mi rechazo a todo tipo de explotación animal I was deeply saddened to see that cages that had previously contained beagles were now empty. All that remained to show that the beagles had been there were food bowls and their experimental cards left hanging on the cage doors. The 30 days of life that this group of beagles had been allowed by HRC had now run out. Although the forlorn little beagle with a dejected look, who had affected me so, was still in her cage, I knew that she too would soon be dead. In just a short while, the room would be completely empty. The brief lives of these gentle animals would have come to an end. As I walked out of the room, I was overcome with sadness and a terrible sense of loss at the death of these beagles. The whole day had become a nightmare, and I decided then and there I could take no more. I therefore walked through the gates of HRC for the final time on that Saturday the 16th of September 1989, 
overwhelmed by the grief and anger that had built up inside me for the past eight months. But with a solemn promise to the animals... <laughs> okay. But with a solemn promise to the animals I walked away from that their suffering would remain a secret no longer. Most people give a lot of thought to ethical dilemmas, but they locate the centre of the ethics in a completely different place. So while they'll acknowledge that there are a lot of ethical issues about using animals, they feel that it's morally justified because not trying to deal with horrendous diseases is ethically objectionable. That for many of them who are using animals to say, let's take the, the, the mo one of the more emotive examples to work on problems of childhood leukemia. Um, you know, you have to use animals as a model because for them that, that is a less bad thing to do than not to try and solve childhood leukemia. Obviously for anti-vivisectionists, the problem of ethics centers on the animals and no use of animals is ever justified. But ethics is at the centre of both sets of decision making. It's just, it just has a completely different focus. Now, I know, of course, that there are scientists who use chimpanzees, but there are also another whole load of scientists who will say, well, you know what, I'm quite happy to do these things on rodents, but I'm not sure that I'd really like to do some of the more invasive techniques on primates. You know, they often personally would draw their species line there. Or they might tell us that there are some techniques that they wouldn't like to do. Um, and I think that's true of quite a lot of the scientists of my acquaintance. They'll, they'll draw the line somewhere. Or there was another scientist we interviewed who said, um, I see the white mice as individuals. Uh, I know a lot of people don't, but I do. I could do these things to a goldfish, but I couldn't do them to a mouse. So, so there are ways of working within science. You have to become used to it. You have to become part of it. And you will learn to justify that if you didn't already with respect to a completely different set of ethics.
In 2004, we got a phone call from Queen's University asking us if we could take a monkey named Darla. And Darla, from the day she moved in, broke our hearts. There was just something about her and her personality and the look she had in her eyes that was extremely painful to look at and you know, be around. It was just really difficult. She was about 17 years old at the time. She had been in a group with some other friends, and unfortunately her friends were still in a study and she, they couldn't come, so she was sent on her own. I wasn't happy about that, but it was the circumstance and that was it. Darla clearly had been in two different studies or different facilities or something like that because she has two tattoo numbers. And normally in a lot of situations, that indicated that they'd move from one facility to the next. Um, so that sort of indicated that she probably had had quite a life of research, you know, at 17 years old. Um, 
She'd probably been through quite a bit. We didn't receive any medical files. Um, they seemed to be really nervous about talking about the kinds of research that they were doing there. Um, months later, when the woman who worked with Darla came for a visit, one of the things she did tell us was that she had been in menstrual studies and her uterus had been removed. So, of course, that was, you know, distressing to know that she'd been involved in that kind of thing. And then what really seemed to affect the woman was when she began to talk about the next study that Darla was involved with, and it was involving anorexia. Now, very vague, not any information, except that she started to cry during that conversation and how she said she couldn't deal with watching it any longer. She did indicate that that was the time where Darla got into a lot of fights over food, which would make sense. So that's when she lost her tail and that's when the damage was done. There's scars all over her body, her piece of her ear is gone and other, other things. When Darla first moved in, I mean, she had this habit of putting her arms or hands up over her eyes, sometimes both hands covering her eyes at the same time with her arms straight up over her eyes. It's pretty clear what it is. She was trying to hide or protect herself or not see what was going on around her. It was her self-defense. Um, that was really awful to see. It was really painful to watch her do that, especially when you were just going to provide enrichment or do something really, you know, something special. But the clutching items, like whatever items might be in the enclosure, I find really painful to watch too, because that to me sort of indicates you know, the need to hug something, the need to hold something, it's usually something that's not very soft, it's a hard object. It might have been a child, you know, that instinct to hold your baby. There's so many things about watching that that are really brutally painful to, to witness. It's difficult for her when she witnesses deaths in the monkey house. That sets her back, that's really traumatic for her, and that's part of the reason why, you know, you see how the lab life just never leaves them. The sad part, over the years, lots of sanctuaries have been approached to take individual monkeys from different laboratories, always secretly, always never knowing anything about the studies they've been involved in, never knowing anything about their past, never knowing about their preferences or their fears or their, you know, what they enjoyed in their life or who they had in their lives, what friends they had. They're hardly ever reunited with old friends and they have memories. They certainly would remember old friends. It's almost as though once the university does something like that and their monkeys arrive in some sanctuary, they make sure that it'll never happen again. They make sure that a termination program is put in place. They don't want the employees to try or hope or get anybody out. So, you know, that's kind of the sad reality of that kind of thing. We recently had the opportunity to possibly rescue two monkeys two rhesus macaques, two girls that could have joined Darla. Unfortunately, the laboratory wasn't willing to, you know, do what we needed to do to do that. So they were terminated. What do you say about that? That's what happens, termination. Research into the unknown is possible through animal experiments. And because the primate is the closest physiologically to man, their use in air medical research is far superior to all other animals. It goes back to the early years of the scientific revolution when um, scientists believed that what was important to science was that it was going to be witnessed. It wasn't just that you did an experiment and happened to write up about it in your living room. Uh, you had to get somebody else to see it. And so one way of it becoming public, what you did, is that you write up the methods. Now, this, this does mean that you're supposed to, it's supposed to be replicable. In practice, of course, it isn't, and especially around animals. Under precisely controlled conditions, the animal does what it damn well pleases. You can't control exactly what animals do and how they, how they behave and so on. But also part of the reason that animals can be unpredictable has to do with the fact that even though they're pretty separated from people in laboratories and they're put in these tiny cages and so on, sometimes individually, they do have some contact with people, some of the time. And there is 
a certain amount of evidence now that how animals are handled matters a great deal in terms of the um, predictability or reproducibility of the results. The notion that by giving the methods in, you know, in detail that the, the experiment is therefore replicable leaves out something which we now call tacit knowledge. There's a great deal of knowledge about how to work particular bits of apparatus, how to handle animals, which doesn't get written down. Of course it's handed down from teacher to student through the generations, but it doesn't actually get written down on the whole. So the desire to control everything, which is fundamental to how science operates, and is very necessary in many ways, can also lead to a kind of multiplying of other effects, which are much more difficult to control. And it's, it's an illusion to think that we can control everything and that we can replicate everything, because it appears that we can't. I don't have any photos from your keys. I'm sure I had ample opportunity to take photos, but I, I just I couldn't do it. I didn't I didn't want to capture them on film. I didn't I didn't want to look back 20 years later and look at Jerome's face. I just so there's a little part of me that you know because I've I've been interviewed so many times and I've I've wished so many times I could just give somebody a photo of him in particular. And then I just think that then I would have a photo of him. <laughs> so I met Jerome before I started working with him. You know, they treated the AIDS project differently. The people who worked with the HIV SIV monkeys also worked with the HIV chimps. They were all captive born here at Yerkes, as far as I understand. Most of them had been infected when they were a lot younger. They, they were infected in different ways. They had studied the roots of transmission, so some of them were infected vaginally, and some were, I guess, given transfusions. And, and uh, Jerome was given, I think, three different strains of virus. The chimp model wasn't working, you know? So the idea had been, like, in, in like the mid-'80s that um, we were gonna need chimps for AIDS research. You know, we just started learning about AIDS in the early-'80s, and, you know, we needed an animal model. and. So they started infecting chimps, you know, in the, I guess in the late 80s, and they just didn't get sick. Nothing happened, you know, and they, they infected them all these different ways and nothing happened, and so they stuck them up in that building in CID and they left them there. I mean, the whole building had just been kind of sitting there for years, you know, they would get hosed down once or twice a day, people would come in and throw chow and give them oranges and then leave and that was it and I vividly recall going in there the first time and you know I had to suit up and which is always an ordeal and you know it's floor-to-ceiling chimps and they didn't know me and you know they still weren't really used to people around all the time and just I all of them started displaying and I just remember them throwing themselves at the cages at us and shit flying everywhere and it was very very overwhelming and I, I think their lives were really boring and really bleak. For a very long time, um, those of us who were working up there, you know, we had started doing enrichment because it was new and fresh and we were supposed to, and so we started, you know, giving them new fruits and vegetables and giving them substrates to play with. And and, uh, and I remember at one point, we'd, we'd, this, this was a pain in the ass, but we gave them straw once. We gave them straw bales. And, that was fun, but it was really, really messy and really hard to clean up. And, you know, nobody wanted to think that he might be getting sick from the HIV. And, uh, and they, you know, tried to blame the, you know, new fruits and vegetables or no, it's the straw or, you know, no, it's this and that. And, you know, it's the corn this time, you know, but he was wasting, you know, and those of us who knew people with AIDS, I mean, we knew he was, this was for real. And, and so they, uh, they started separating him from his group because he, he started getting really weak and that's when I really started working with him in earnest. I have a
have mixed feelings about this now, but we nursed him back to life. I mean, we really, I think we saved his life so that he could die a few months later. I mean, it was like a friend of mine at Chimphaven put up a, a question the other, yesterday or a couple days ago, and she said that somebody had recently asked her if she had ever seen a chimp cry. And, you know, and I, I wrote in and I said, I have, you know. When I first started being around him, I mean, he really, he was just, he was skeletal. Just, just a skeleton, and you know. And then when, when he'd gotten separated from his group, and we knew his, you know, we started talking about AIDS. You know, he just he, he couldn't hold his head up anymore. And he he would he would sit on the floor and he would prop his head on his hand. And if he wanted to look at something, he would have to turn his head with his hand. You know, and he would he would cry. I saw him cry and just curl up on the floor in front of me in a fetal position and. He just, you know, I, I've actually said to people before, the only difference to me between the humans I worked with who had AIDS and Jerome was that he didn't know what was going on. There was no way to explain to him. And because he wasn't on a funded study, nobody really knew what was going on. Nobody was able to treat him. And the sicker he got, the less other people wanted to go up there and be around him. Because he, he just got to a point where he was so needy and just so miserable. And so he's almost the one. <laughs> I think a lot of it was, yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I had a sense of what he was going through just because you know, I'd seen people, humans, go into that state. He really didn't like people. I mean, I, I hate to anthropomorphize, but he was a teenage boy. I mean, he really, you know, he did not want some older, you know, woman <laughs> around him. He didn't want humans around him. I feel like he he kept me around because he needed somebody and I was really the only one regularly there. I mean there were other people who cared about him but you know when he was separated from his group I had the sense that he knew he needed somebody to be on his side and I tried to be very clear with him that I'm here for you you know and I'll do whatever I can for you but I also have all these other folks I have to take care of but you know, no matter what you do to me or how mad you get at me, I'll, I'll still be here. So you do what you have to do. I tried to stay very involved with the researchers so I knew what the plan was. And, you know, they wanted to be able to say they had the first chimp with AIDS. And so I don't really remember who made the decision that when he, when he got an AIDS-defining illness, they would euthanize him. Brent brought this stretcher up and he covered it with a sheet and made like a pillow on it, which I almost found just revolting. Even at the time and looking back, I just, I still just, what a strange, what a disconnect, you know? Here I am, I've been told for two years, you know, don't care. Don't care. You cannot care. We're here for science. You know, then all of a sudden it's acknowledged that I love this chimp and I'm upset and let's do this funny ceremony where we put him on a stretcher with a sheet on it and a pillow? We're going to kill him in like half an hour and he, I don't know, it was very strange. So Brent and Denise put him on the stretcher and covered him up like he was sleeping and I kissed him goodbye and that was it. I knew for a long time before I left that I couldn't support the research anymore. I just knew when I, you know, the whole time I was with Jerome, I just, I knew I had to document what was happening to him and I, I knew that, I knew that I had to leave and tell his story and I, I, it's not really in my nature to do things like that and I, I just, I felt very obligated, you know, I felt like I took this blood money to work in this place and I did these things that I had to as part of my job and not you know, so I didn't get fired, but you know, in payment, I guess, or payback or whatever, I, I had to talk. And so when I left, I was told after that, that what we learned from Jerome was that HIV causes AIDS. I'm not sure how taking the life of a 14-year-old chimp and subjecting dozens of other chimps to that kind of life is any sort of justification for for anything, frankly. I mean, I don't... Um, I, I don't... 
I don't know why anybody would think that that's necessary. I mean, uh, Frank Novembre got some publications out of Jerome, and and uh, Nathan actually was infected with Jerome's blood, and Nathan's also dead now. I don't know what was necessary about any of that, and I. I don't know. I don't know what to say. I mean, to me, there's just, there's no moral justification for treating sentient beings in that manner. This is history. This isn't, I mean, there, there's so many thousands of them that are gone. You know, they were used in some study, they were used up and they were euthanized and we'll never know who they were or, you know, their stories will never be out there, even though each of their stories was really different from their cage mate stories. His most important laboratory tools, the animals he employs in research, are unreliable. When we plan studies, no one ever says, you know, Let's be really careful about this study. Let's exhaust all the possibilities we have on the bench first. No one ever really talks about that. It's, okay, what can we do next? What can we put into these animals? What can we do to further our data to meet our deadlines? So it's, it's been tough on me in that sense, but I mean, the real victims are, of course, the animals. What is wrong? He's a qualified man provided with the very finest working tools in laboratory equipment. I hope I've done some good with the work that I've done. There's just no way of knowing until, until the end, whatever that is. What I'm doing is being done for what I hope are the best of reasons, which is to try to help these individuals who, through no fault of their own, have been ripped away from their homes, their families, placed in virtual prisons, subjected to uh, procedures that you wouldn't wish on your enemy, let alone somebody who's innocent of everything. This man knows, through bitter experience, that the quality of results of his entire project is directly related to the quality of the laboratory animals with which he is supplied. I am happy that I can't compartmentalize it and I can't detach myself from it emotionally because I think that's the kind of attitude all scientists should have. You know, I was fortunate enough to find that I'm not alone, that there are other people out there that have experienced a similar feeling that I have, that they see it as you know, fundamentally wrong. We've got a little of everything here. It's a Noah's Ark. Rabbits, guinea pigs, rats, mice, and numerous other animals. If your heart tells you what you want to do, if you don't think you need to use animals in this way or you don't want to do it because it violates your personal ethics, don't do it. Speak up. That's no longer a deal breaker. It's not going to get you kicked out of medical school. It's not going to get you thrown out of your biology class in high school. Somewhere along the line, this animal became diseased or suffered malnutrition or perhaps it was genetically impure or housed in a substandard environment. To the animals, you know, I, I feel horrible. I, I mean, I can only say that I'm sorry and I will advocate for change and, you know, push hard to, to really change this industry. This man can now get back to work. He knows that the animals that he has just received are healthy and uniform. He knows that his laboratory tools are now all to standard. When we come out and tell the stories from the animal's perspective, it's just, it's undeniable. You can't argue with the fundamental nature of research when people like me are coming out and telling you, you knew these apes, I knew these monkeys, I can tell you their names, I can still smell the smells of the lab, and it was very real, it's still very real, and it's still going on, and it's not going to stop until something changes, and I just know that it's nice to have advocates on one side and we have the research on the other side, but you know, the folks caught in the middle are 
the animals, and so it's, it's up to us to come out and talk about them. Till me, till walk to me. Till walk to me.